church of fame, far across the bounding main, like a bird on high out to do or die on his journey over there. Many million hearts beat for him, and the whole world said a prayer for Lindbergh. Oh, what a flying fool was he! Lindbergh, his name will live in history. Over the ocean he flew all alone, gambling with fate and with dangers unknown. Others may take that trip across the sea upon some future day. But take your hats off to lucky, lucky Lindbergh, the eagle of the USA. Up through the fog, mid the snow and the sleet, 33 hours right there in one seat. Soon he'll be back among us once again, so shout hip, hip, hooray. So take your hats off to lucky, lucky Lindbergh, that eagle of the USA. Come in. Yes, Mum. Elsie, would you please fix me a hot lemonade? Right away, Mum. You're not coming down with the baby's cold. Oh, I do feel a little achy. I wonder if she wants to see the baby. I'm just going in. I'm sure she will. Mrs. Lindbergh? Yes? Mrs. Lindbergh, do you have the baby? Why, no, I don't have him. Why? Where's the Colonel? Maybe he has him. Downstairs in the library. Colonel Lindbergh? Excuse me, Colonel. Do you have the baby? No. Isn't he in his crib? No, sir. Oh, my God. Betty. Betty, tell Waitley to call the police. Anne. Anne, do 
You see that envelope? We're not to touch that envelope. We're not to touch anything in the room. And they've stolen our baby. Oh, please, God, no. Colonel Lindbergh has given us permission to use his garage as a command post. And I want a switchboard, and I want telephones, and I want men operating them 24 hours a day. I want you men to spread out and scour every inch of this ground. Now, if you find anything, let me know. like a ladder was here, too. Yeah, this here one, maybe, huh? I'll bet. Fits perfect. I'll bet it'll fit the marks on the wall, too. Yeah, whoever used it was too heavy for it, though. At least was on the ways down, he was. Colonel Schwarzkopf, head of the state police. Yes, we know each other. How are you, Harry? Fine, sir. Let me see that, Harry. I think this letter must be seen in private. Come on, Charlie. We got a lot of work to do in the yard. I have fifty thousand dollars in real, twenty-five thousand dollars in twenty bills. We warn you for making anything public or for notify the police. The child is in good care. Indication for all letters are signature and three holes. Okay, light! Light him! All right, give me some more lights. I want the whole place flooded. Come on, give us one you, you will know. Come on, give us one Quiet, quiet, quiet. Look what I found here. Come on, give us one Stay there. Stay there. Hold on. Found this chisel not far from where you found the rat. Stay back. Stay back. Keep back. When you came in, Colonel, this window was closed. That is correct. It was closed, but it had not been locked. 
Don't say anything, Colonel. This is a report from one of the yellow Colonel stripes Limbers. in the United States. Colonel Limbers, I'd just like to express my sympathy, Throw this sir. hat Could as you give me an idea of how the family feels. Is Mrs. Lindbergh prostrate with grief? Is she crying? Now, we understand one of the servants may have been involved. Do you have any information about the servants? Now, Miss Gow, you say that ordinarily the family would return to Englewood on Mondays. The house is not finished, as you can see. We've been spending weekends here only. And this week, Mrs. Lindbergh decided not to bring the baby back to Englewood until Tuesday because of his cold. So she said to me. Do you have any idea how an outsider could have learned about this change in plans? I do not, sir. No, William. President Hoover did not cause this depression. The roots of such things go deep. Now, to me, whether it's present economic policies are right or wrong, he is a great American. Well, there are a lot of us today who don't think so, Dr. Kahn, and we think things ought to be changed. William, my father was an Irish immigrant who sent seven children through college on a stonecutter's wages. Now, in what other country in the world could any man do that? Extra, extra, Lindbergh's baby kidnapped. Colonel Charles Lindbergh's son? Yes, sir. Read all about it. Here you are. Extra, extra, Lindbergh's baby kidnapped. Extra, Lindbergh's Good Lord in heaven. Extra, this is a crime against all Americans. There you go again, Dr. Condon. I mean, it's terrible, yes, but why? Why is it more terrible than the taking of anyone else's child? No details yet, just the fact of the deed. William. Once in a thousand years comes a hero of heroes. Heroic in heart, soul, mind, as well as body. Such a man is Colonel Lindbergh, and a crime against this young man is a crime against all of us. A shame. A shame on the greatest country in the world. Gee whiz, golly wallop, Professor. Do you really believe all that? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Although we had some close-ups in this crowd stuff. It's coming up soon. Can't we speed this up or something? Now, here come the close-ups now. All right, Dawson, do your stuff. Oh, hello, Doc. Right. This is Zeke Dawson, our recognition expert. Doc Schoenfeld. Hi. Doc's interested in criminal psychology. The captain said he could work on a case with us. Zeke is looking for uh, organized crime figures who might seem to have a special interest in Lindbergh. If you'll forgive my bluntness, gentlemen, I think you're wasting your time. I don't believe the kidnapper is a member of organized crime. I don't know, but would professional abductors pick a national hero, practically a god, so that maximum attention would be called to their crime? And would a gang ask for a mere $50,000? I think a gang would have asked for a quarter of a million. All right, Doc, dream up a suspect for us. All right. I think the kidnapper chose the Lindbergh baby because of who he was and not primarily for money. A loony. A man of inferior status, but with feelings of omnipotence. A man with secret dreams of great power for himself. Then suddenly Lindbergh does the impossible. He flies the Atlantic in a single-engine plane not much bigger than a box kite. 33 hours in the air alone, half of it in the dark, and no navigational equipment. Now the potential kidnapper sees the world on his knees before Lindbergh. Feelings of jealous rage overwhelm him. Why do they worship Lindbergh while he goes unnoticed, unappreciated? He will destroy this enemy with one blow. Look, By God. stealing, at the risk of his own life, the exalted one's most precious possession, his son. That's an interesting theory, Doc. You don't mind if we check out the known professionals, do you? <laughs> I have no more comment at this time, but my wife would like to ask a favor of all of you concerning the baby. Anne? Our son has a slight cold, and we hope that you will all print that fact and say that we appeal to them not to let him get chilled. Also, being only 20 months old, his diet is important. 
He is a good eater, and we are sure that the kidnappers wish to keep him in good health. He likes orange juice. I give him a half cup in the mornings. And during the day, he will take about one quart of milk. In the morning and evening, he eats three tablespoons of cooked cereal. And once a day, two tablespoons of cooked vegetables. Fruitcakes in the world. Hey, look at this. Mailed in Brooklyn last night. We got a letter from them. And they say he's well. He's very well. And he's being fed according to the diet. Isn't that good news? Yes. And we're working on getting the money. And we will get it. They also said that they'll be in touch with us very soon. You're not afraid, are you? No. I know we'll get Charlie back. Criminals. Is the underworld running the government now? Is this an admission by President Hoover that the government is helpless? If it is, maybe Franklin D. Roosevelt is right. Maybe we do need a new president. Well, Dad, you're going to have indigestion. I again. did the right thing. If there was any doubt in right, my mind. What did you do, Dad? Well, let me read you something. Uh, I offer myself as go-between so a loving mother may again have her child. And Colonel Lindbergh may know that the American people are grateful for the honor bestowed upon them by his pluck and daring. I am ready at my own expense to go anywhere. Also... Dad! I sent this to the Bronx Home News. The Bronx Home News? Oh, Dad, what in heaven's name makes you think the kidnappers are going to read a newspaper like the Bronx Home News? And what business is it of yours anyway? Well, would you let the police handle it? Al Capone offered to help, didn't they? If they'd just let him out of jail. Nobody thought that was ridiculous. What's so ridiculous about an honest citizen offering to help? Mr. Waitley, I'm puzzled about the dog. Why do you suppose he didn't bark? He was at the opposite end of the house, sir. A rather large house. With you? With me. Lindbergh residence. Who? Just a moment, please. We've already checked the fingerprints and shown it around to the local carpenters and builders. But nothing. Oh, here's the Colonel. Colonel Schwarzkopf, this is Mr. Kaler of the Forest Service. Oh, Mr. Colonel. Kaler. Glad you're here, although I don't know if there's anything you can do that hasn't already been done. Uh, I'd like to begin, Colonel, by reenacting that part of the crime that had to do with the ladder. Now? Yes, sir. Fine. George, you and Alex take this ladder and go with Mr. Kaler. Oh. There's nothing like a good hot cup of coffee. I almost forgot. Sergeant Finn of the NYPD called again. What's he want now? He still insists he has to study the kidnap notes. Is he crazy or something? Why should I give my evidence to New York? Next time he calls, tell him the New Jersey State Police are handling the case. He claims Colonel Lindbergh. I know. Colonel Lindbergh has confidence in him. Colonel Lindbergh has confidence in his household servants, too. I don't. <laughs>
Come in. I'm sorry to bother you, Colonel. This is Mr. Andrew Phelps. How do you do, sir? I apologize for intruding like this. Now, we stopped Mr. Phelps at the crossroads, Colonel. But he says he has some important information concerning your son. What is it you have to tell me, sir? With apologies to this gentleman, I wonder if we might have privacy, Colonel. Of course. I'll wait out here. Won't you take a seat, Mr. Phelps? Yes. Yes, thank you. I've been very upset about this matter, Colonel. As I know all good Americans are. And I'm glad that I'm going to be able to do something constructive about it. I would like to show you something. America loves you, Colonel. But I have something here that will help Americans memorialize your son and perhaps pay off the ransom at the same time. These will sell for one dollar apiece. Every American will want one. We will advertise that the proceeds are for the ransom fund. Chief Wolf! Get, get this crackpot out of my house. Come on. Colonel Schwarzkopf? Yes? I've got a character here who insists he has a message for Colonel Lindbergh. Another one. I'm authorized to take Colonel Lindbergh's messages. May I help you? Sir, and I do not mean to belittle your position, but I have here a message from the kidnapper himself with instructions to give it to no one but Colonel Lindbergh. Uh, shall I give you my uh, credentials? I'd be happy to hear your credentials. Professor of Education at Fordham University. Athletic instructor. Principal of public school number 12 in the Bronx. What's your full name, sir? Dr. John Francis Condon. Where are you, doctor? All right. You hang on there. We'll send some men out to talk to you. You may do that if you wish, but... May I suggest, sir, that the dangers of trusting me and putting me through to Colonel Lindbergh may be far less than the dangers of delay. Hold on. I'm going off the line. Hold on. Get me Colonel Lindbergh on this phone. Yes. This is probably another blind alley, Colonel, but I've got a call here I want to pass through to you. Oh, hello, uh, Colonel Lindbergh. This is... Oh, they, they've explained. Well, I have received in the mail a letter which I believe to be from the kidnappers. Oh, yes, of, of course I will. Uh, Dear sir, if you are willing to act as go-between in Lindbergh case, please follow strictly instructions. Handle enclosed letter personally to Mr. Lindbergh. And enclosed is a small envelope addressed personally to you. Please open that one and read it to me. Of course. Just a minute. Here are the contents of the letter addressed to you. Mr. Colonel Lindbergh, Hopewell, dear sir, Mr. Condon may act as go-between. You may give him the $70,000. Make one packet. Well, have Finn's people in New York pick him up for extortion. Maybe discourage some of these loonies. After we have the money in hand, we will tell you where to find your boy. Is that all? That seems to be all, sir. Very well. I'm sure Colonel Schwarzkopf would be very interested in discussing the further details with you, sir. Oh, oh one more thing. Uh, there's a, well, sort of a drawing, uh, a couple of interlocking circles. Circles? Interlocking? This is the same signature. 
It could not be a forgery because it's never been printed in the papers. Do you see what I'm up against, Colonel? They build a duplicate ladder, and it holds a man of 160 pounds. But it breaks when the man carries a 30-pound bundle. Conclusion, the kidnapper probably weighed in the middleweight class. I got to read about that in the papers. Colonel Schwarzkopf thinks he has his reasons. Jim. Oh, he has his reasons, all right. They're all spelled E-G-O. Ego. This is a copy of the latest note. Strictly confidential. Now, it would cause serious complications if any of the papers got a hold of that signature. We'd never know if we were dealing with the right man again. This was written by a German. That seems to be a possibility. And it was mailed in the Bronx. The Bronx? And Schwarzkopf has got to start cooperating. And we're in the territory. Doss, find Dr. Schoenfeld. Dr. Schoenfeld is an expert in criminal psychology. He believes he can help us identify the kidnapper. And Jim, I've accepted the services of a go-between. Look at this. Jaffsey. His name is John F. Condon. J.F.C. J.F.C. Oh, Jaffsey. It's very clever. Colonel Schwarzkopf has checked him out thoroughly. He and I are convinced that the man is honest and dependable. He's already received a phone call from their man trying to set up a meeting. When? As soon as we have proof that they have the child. What kind of proof? We've asked for the child's sleeping garment. I'm going to need the serial numbers of the ransom money. As soon as we have proof that we're dealing with the right people, we'll pay the ransom and you'll get the serial numbers. You want some coffee, Colonel? <sighs> oh, no thanks, Jim. What about this other man I read about in the paper? John Hughes Curtis. Mr. Curtis also claims to be in touch with the kidnappers. Colonel Schwarzkopf has checked him out. Yes, I read about that in the papers, too. I'm sure Colonel Schwarzkopf will share the evidence at the proper time. You mean after he has the kidnappers in custody, huh? Lieutenant, I'm trying to help you with What this I am trying to tell you, Colonel, is that our chances of accomplishing the safe return of your son would be better if Colonel Schwarzkopf would share his evidence with us. It would not be too difficult for me to get the impression that there are some considerations in this case more important than the safe return of my son. Anything new, Colonel? Who did you speak with in New York? Did you pay the ransom? Any suspect? Why won't Colonel Schwarzkopf talk to you? Yeah, what's he hiding? Gentlemen, please. I told you when I had something, I would let you know. Mrs. Lindbergh is well. She's keeping to herself and waiting for word and minding her own business, which is perhaps an example we could all follow. Question that pretty maid at your mother-in-law's house today. Violet Sharp. Yes. I think she knows something. And what makes you think that? Hey, Colonel, aren't you tired? I suppose I am. I I don't know. You haven't slept. That I know of for more than a week. Why do you suspect Violet Sharp? She is very evasive. She claimed she spent the evening of March 1st at a movie. Well. She doesn't know who she was with, or the name of the movie, or even what it was about. Violet is engaged, more or less, as I understand it, to my mother-in-law's butler. Pound. So if she did go to the movies that night with a young man, well, I can understand why she would wish not to remember it. Yes. This is he. Dr. Condon. The package came. And what is in it? Uh, the uh, sleeping garment, I uh, think. Uh, shall I bring it down for you to identify? 
No, 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 no. If the reporters here find out you're in on this thing, you'll never have another moment alone. I'll come there as soon as I can sneak away. Dr. Condon. Sorry to keep you up so late. All right, I was hardly aware of the time. Package is here. Oh. I heard so. I'm sorry, dear, to disturb you. Colonel Lindbergh, my daughter, Myra. My apologies, Miss Condon. There's no apology necessary. I'll just have a look at this. It gives instructions for the rendezvous. Miss Sharp, why did you lie to us about going to a movie the last time we talked? I, I was afraid Octavius would be angry. I, I, w I went to a roadhouse and danced that night. Who were you with? Uh, Tartan and Ernie and another couple. What was the other couple's name? I, I can't remember. And I can't remember Ernie's last name. What time did you get home that night? About 11. And when did you find out about the kidnapping? Um, shortly after I got into the house. I, I don't feel like answering so many questions. Dr. Haggerty's in the next room. You want him to give you something? No, I just, I just want to be left alone. Miss Sharp, when the child was taken, we interviewed both you and your sister, Emily. We asked you to remain available to us and to keep us apprised of your plans. We only discovered yesterday that Emily applied for her visa to return to England on the day of the kidnapping. Uh, did she? Mm-hmm. On the, on the day? Oh, well, it, it must have been just, just... Why did she sail for England without telling the police she was going? Are you... Are you insinuating that my sister... Oh, oh, how dare you? Oh, the brass of you! My sister happened to be one of the finest, one of the most trustworthy, one of the most honest people at... Oh, you monsters, you! You don't give any quarter, do you? said Raymond Cemetery. You sure he'll recognize this? It's it's one of his favorites. He'll say elephant. 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 I'm sure I'll know him. Well, I want to follow this fence. The note said stop at the end of the fence, right by the post stop. I don't like the look of this place. I'll go with you. No, the note said I was to come alone. I'll uh, come back for the money after I've made contact.
Doesn't seem to be anybody here, Colonel. Hey, Doctor! Doctor! All right, over here. Got the money with you? It's in the car. I wanted to see the baby for... The coffee is ready. No. Only the cemetery guards. <laughs> Stay where you are. Why are you so cowardly? Why did you run away? Too much of a risk. I did not come here to arrest you. I came here to get the baby. I could get 30 years. Maybe I could even burn. Burn? Why should you burn? What if the baby is dead? Would I burn if the baby is dead? What are we doing negotiating here if the baby is dead? The baby's not dead. Now go and get the money. Where is the baby? They could not get the baby for about eight hours. But you promised when we turned over the money, you'd turn over the baby. I give you a note showing where the baby is. No, you will take me to the baby now. Impossible. My boss would snuck me out. They would drill me. What is your name? John. John. John is my name, too. Bist du Deutsch? Are you German? Go and get the money. One thing first. Colonel Lindbergh is not a rich man. These are depression times. He's been unable to raise the extra $20,000, but I can go to the car now and get you the original $50,000. But suppose if we can't get the 70, we take the 50. No, you go and get the money, and I will give you the note when you return the money to me. I want one more piece of proof. Hmm. I just want to show you something. Slowly, very slowly. Ever seen these before? Yeah. They were the pins that held on the baby's blanket in the crib. Now go and get the money. Wait here. They bring the baby. No. No? Why? Well, he promised to give me a note telling a note? me. A note? We brought the money. Telling me exactly where the baby was. Now, I. I don't want to make the transfer on that basis. We have no choice. We'll give him the money. But uh, only 50,000. I talked him out of the extra 20. How? I'll explain later. Dr. Condon, I want you to know how much I appreciate I what I think you... I'd better go. Is on the boat, Nellie. It is a small boat, 29 feet long. Two persons are on the boat. They are innocent. You will find the boat one mile at sea between Horse Neck Beach and Gay Head near Elizabeth Island. Well, shall we go to your home, Doctor? I'd like to phone the good news to my wife.
over the rendezvous point now. Do you see anything? Nothing. Doctor, yes, what's the real reason? reason? Many times, if you will just listen. My only reason was because I wanted to see that baby's arms around his mother's neck again. Are you but sure that's the only reason? I would not say it if I were not sure, madam. What other reason, doctor? What is a true reason? I have reason? just stated the reason. Are you sure you didn't reason? have some selfish interest? Doctor, doctor, no. Doctor, no. doctor, no. doctor, no. doctor do you not have something they to gain did. through all oh, this? Please what please did you advertise in the Bronx? This is the United news. States of America. Yeah, what not, makes you think the kidnappers are the Bronx? No, no. That's correct, Lieutenant. They gave me the address to this apartment house in Newark, and that's when I met them. And you actually saw some of the ransom money? Oh, absolutely, except the serial numbers. And they're gonna call you at the Prince George Hotel today to arrange a new rendezvous to deliver the baby? That's correct. Well, thank you, Mr. Curtis. You'll wanna be there when they call. Yes. Uh, Colonel, would you mind sticking around for a few minutes? No, not at all. It's been a pleasure, Lieutenant. I'll keep you posted. Thank you. Colonel, I hope we have some really good news by the time you get there. I'll meet you at your hotel, Mr. Curtis. Right. I don't know what this fellow was up to, Colonel, but... He's a respectable businessman. It would have been supremely easy for Mr. Curtis to bring one of the ransom bills back with him as positive proof that he was in touch with the right people. He didn't. And when we checked out that apartment address in Newark, it was empty. Well, isn't that logical? Yeah, it's perfectly logical. It's also logical that if he was a phony, he'd give us the address of an empty apartment. We think he's a phony. Doc? Colonel, I've studied the transcript of Dr. Condon's statement, and two facts stand out. One, John recognized the safety pins that held the baby's blanket that night. Therefore, he personally was in that room. Second, although John said he couldn't do this or that because his boss would smack him out or drill him, he reduced the ransom from 70000 to fifty on his own initiative. Now, to me, this indicates that John is the kidnapper and is acting alone. If this is true, then Curtis is a phony. That may very well be, gentlemen, but under the circumstances, I can't be expected to discard any of the possibilities, can I? Exactly on station, gentlemen. This time I hope we can rendezvous successfully. Captain, it was the traffic that uh, scared them away the last two times. I mean, there's just way too much traffic. Float on the starboard bow, 5,000 yards. Randall, that must be it. Train the machine gun on the craft dead ahead. Just in case this should turn out to be a plot to kidnap you, Colonel. It's just a fishing smack.
Colonel, they gotta be around here someplace. Uh, rail number 16. A top rung on the bottom ladder. Soft pine. Now, it's a left-hand side rail. Notice the four nail holes. Square nail holes. Square. It's very rare. Because if I could find one of the few places in this country where they I still don't have any men to spare. If I could find one of the few places, we would have a, a good lead. Because the chances of four nail holes existing in this world that would exactly fit and match these four holes without their once having shared the same four nails. Now, the chances of that are almost, almost mathematically Mr. non-existent. Mr. this is fascinating stuff, important stuff. There's no question about it, but I can't give you any men. I'm sorry, you're on your own. What is it, Severino? Colonel Lindbergh. Colonel, a radio message just came. The baby, they found him. Dead. Some hunters discovered the body, and just two miles from their house. Hey, why can't we get closer? Come on, we want to look. Can't see anything from here. Stay where you are now. This is evidence. Hey, get back, lady. Is that the hole where they found the baby? Yes, ma'am. This is it. Hey, is it true his skull's crushed? Quick, show, but I want to see too. Take it off. Is that the body of your baby? It is. In the back of the envelope here, we usually place your name and address. Look what the kidnapper has written. Lindbergh. Unwittingly, of course, but again, it reveals his self-identification with Lindbergh. This just came. More ransom money. This one was spent here. Well, it looks as if he lives here. Works down here, Manhattan. Strews bills along the main arteries. That's pretty much as you predicted, Doc. Well, these ransom notes help. I wonder why uh, Schwartzkopf finally gave him up. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he knows we're going to get this guy. He wants us to say we did it with his cooperation. I figure he probably buys his gas somewhere close to where he lives, wouldn't you say, Doc? I put every gas station in this area on special alert. What do you do with this fellow when you find him? I mean, what do I do with him, Doc? I'm going to grab him. Where? I don't know. Maybe at his home. Huh? Let me say something. I think if you surround his house, you'll give him time to dispose of evidence. And without evidence, you're going to have trouble holding him. Now, if you grab him away from his house, and if he's the man I think he is with delusions of his own importance, he'll definitely be carrying one of those ransom bills on him to remind him of his great victory over Lindbergh. You've been a big help, Doc. 
But you know, when I catch this guy, that's going to be the parting of the ways for you and me. You know that. Why? Because then you're going to try and prove he's crazy and save him for psychological research. And I'm going to try and burn him. Oh, here. I'll give you a hand. No. These just go in the carton here. These were in the bedroom. Oh, no, no. Here, let me. Thank you. The valises are all full. You have to squeeze them shut again. I think leaving here is going to do us a lot of good. The new baby will be coming soon. We need a change. A, a new start. Get back to a normal life again. I still think it's rotten that you should be driven out of your home by reporters and threats and crank letters. Poor old Dr. Condon's had it just as bad, worse even in some ways. At least none of the cranks is accusing me of the kidnapping. They may not all be cranks. Forgive us for barging in like this, gentlemen. But Mr. Curtis has something important to say to you, Colonel. Go ahead, Mr. Curtis. Colonel, for your sake, and especially for Mrs. Lindbergh's sake. I'm, I'm deeply sorry if I've caused you any, any kind of inconvenience or any kind of heartache. But, um, you see, I, ha I haven't been telling you the whole truth. I lied. I mean about everything, about the uh, boat, about the uh, gang. Everything was just a big lie. Oh, God. Jeez, it must have been insane. I'm sane now, but I had to be ins I, I had to be insane. Fighting my way through those reporters, I suddenly realized how a salmon must feel Struggling upstream to duck. All those today, huh? And I'm going to throw them all away. Uh, I don't want to see them. They were so ugly, they made me ill. There is one, though, Dad. It's a small envelope inside a big one marked for Dr. Condon only. And the note says, enclosed, you'll find a picture of the kidnapper. Well, what is it? A mirror. Oh. <laughs> you know that Dr. Haggerty said... The doctor said... can say what he likes. He's not being tortured. John, not to allow your emotions to... I will to... not talk to them again, Octavius. I'm not angry <laughs> about the young man. Just tell them who he is. <laughs> Make them go away. I will not talk to them again. Never again. Never. Never. No. Hello, pal. Good day, sir. Uh, Violet's just gone up to her room to tidy up a bit. They keep her busy here, as you might imagine. Uh, would you care to come inside? I'll go and fetch her. Well, I think we'll be driving her down to my office. You see, we have this recording device down there. And this way, we can get everything we need once and for all. And we won't bother her again. Well, thank you, sir, for that. I'm sure that will make her very happy. She's been a bit upset. We know. Uh, would you care to come in? I'll go and fetch her. Violet! If you'll wait a moment, sir, I'll fetch her. Violet!
Dr. Conlon. Thank you for coming, Dr. Conlon. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you again, but we want to talk to you about Violet Sharp. Violet Sharp? We have not been able to find anything to implicate her in the kidnapping. Do you think her suicide was an omission of guilt? Perhaps I might have a year ago, but now that I've experienced some of the harassment that poor child must have experienced, I can understand how an innocent person would fervently wish for peace, even the eternal kind. One way to end the questioning is to confess. Perhaps she had nothing to confess. But speaking of you, doctor. Yes. Now, I want to know what your real relationship to this man, John, is, whom nobody has seen but you. Gentlemen, if I weren't so tired, I would find this irony amusing. So, you want to question me again, do you? From the beginning. Up, we'll miss the first editions. I called my paper an hour ago and told them I'd be late, but I never thought we'd be this late. Mrs. Lindbergh's doctor went in exactly two hours and four minutes. Hey, 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 what? What was it? What was it? Doctor, 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 doctor. Come on, we got a deadline. Doctor. We are happy to announce, ladies and gentlemen, that Colonel and Mrs. Lindbergh are the proud parents of a son. How much does the baby weigh, doctor? Uh, the baby weighs seven pounds. Mother and child are doing well. What's the baby's name? Oh, no name has been selected yet, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, Mrs. Lindbergh and I would like to make an urgent appeal to the press to let our new son grow up normally and not to subject him to the publicity which we feel contributed greatly to the death of our first. Look at this, Doc. $10 gold certificate. This one was passed. Here. Lowe's Theater. The cashier said it was folded like this, once lengthwise and twice across. Right. Just like most of the others. And she got a good look at the guy because he just tossed it at her and let her unfold it. He annoyed her, so she stared at him. Arrogance. Mm -hmm. And get this, Doc. Her description fits Dr. Condon's description to a T. You know what galls me, Doc? The bank tellers. These certificates are easily recognizable. The serial numbers were distributed to every bank teller in the city. They've been flooding this area here for months. And not one teller has noticed one bill in time to catch the guy that passed it, or even to give us a description of it. You all from Lyle? I have been up to now. Lieutenant Finn, the police. Did you make a deposit at the Corn Exchange Bank and Trust Company at 125th Street and Park Avenue at noon today? Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This gold certificate was part of that deposit. Did you happen to notice these numbers written down along here? Sure, I wrote them on there. Why? Well, that's, uh, that's a license number. Mr. Fortas, would you mind checking this license number with the Motor Vehicle Bureau? You got a phone inside? Uh, yes, sir. Help yourself. I heard something about, uh, you know, watching out for gold certificates, and I didn't like uh, the looks of the bird who gave it to me, so... What did he look like? Well, I guess, uh, the first thing I remembered about him was, uh, his accent. A real German type of accent. All right, now tell, tell me everything you can about him, Walter. Give me all the details. Describe his face to me. Well, I, uh, he was... He had high cheekbones. And, uh, all his eyes, his eyes were beady. You know, light eyes, real light, kind of, uh, grayish blue. What about the car? Uh, Plymouth uh, sedan, brown. What about his attitude, Walter? Attitude? Yeah. Well, I say about... Oh, you mean the way he act? Yeah. I say kind of smart aleck, uh, superior type. In fact, uh... We got it, Lieutenant. License number 4U13-41, registered Bruno Richard Halpern. 279 East 222nd Street, the Bronx, New York City.
Guy keeps bankers' hours. Hey, hey. That's our boy. Plymouth. License plate number, 4U1341. Why don't you tell us the whole story? Make it easy for yourself. What whole story? I don't know anything about it. What about this gold certificate? Didn't Dr. Condon give you that? I don't know anybody by that name. Hey, Lieutenant! Lieutenant What do you want? Got a present for you, Jim. Almost $14,000. And all the numbers, Max. I'll be right down. You'll have to come with us, Mrs. Hoffman. Rudy, Rudy, what have you done? No. Rudy, what have you done? Nothing. Please uh, read this aloud. Step forward. My boss would smack me out. Is this the man? Read the rest of it. Dear doctor. No, louder, louder, as though you were calling me. Hey, doctor. Looks like the man? Yes. 
Is it him? Step back. Are you identifying? Not at this moment, no. I, I have to be very careful. This man's life is in jeopardy. All right, thank you, doctor. Would you mind waiting in the next room, please? Oh, thank you. See the man who gave you the $10 gold certificate in the line. Go over and point him out. This is him right here. Finn. Yeah? All right, send him up. Tell him I'll meet him at the top of the stairs. Hello, Colonel. Glad you could make it. Ben? Want to come over here and give a listen? Hmm. Number one. Hey, doctor, over here. Hmm. Number two. Hey, doctor, over here. No. Number three. Number four. Hey, doctor. Over here. That's the voice I heard in the cemetery. Are you certain? There's no question about it. You want to see him? Yes. Send out number four. the new governor of New Jersey. Tell me, is that good or is it bad? For you, it could be bad, Bruno. He's a pal of Lindy's. So he says to me, do you belong to the American Legion? I says, of course. He says, what about the VFW? I says, the VFW, the Rotary Club, the Masons, you name it, mister. The only thing I don't belong to yet is the Daughters of the American Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Elks, the Knights of Pythias, the Odd Fellows. That's how you want, Hal. Your fellow club members voted you in. Great of you to drop by, Dave. Well, I had to congratulate my old pal. And it's appreciated, too. One, uh, <clears throat> one quick serious note before you go, Dave. You know uh, that I promised to exterminate the racketeers and gangsters in New Jersey. And I promised that even knowing I was going to have a Democrat for an attorney general. But I knew you'd work with me, Dave, and not let party interfere. All the way, Hal. Right. It's uh, important to me, too, that this uh, Lindbergh thing be handled right. As you know, Slim Lindbergh and I have known each other for many, many years, and his father-in-law, Dwight Morrow, well, I practically worshipped that man. I was his political disciple. Well, Hal, you'll be happy to know I've decided to take that over myself. Take what over? The trial. You mean, uh, prosecute? 
Huntington County can't afford a trial like that. The state will have to pay for it. Well, Dave, you're the state's attorney general, but uh, can you afford to get tied up for months? Uh... This one's too important, Hal. I'm taking personal charge. Good. Again, congratulations, Governor. Thanks. See you around, Fred. If there's a way to become a household word, he'll find it. You think he's found it? If he gets a conviction on this case, we'll be up to our eyeballs and Democrats. <laughs> kidnap letters! Get your kidnap letters here! How do I look, okay? Just like Valentina. Uh -huh. Come on. Okay. Thank you. this court here and I and they shall be heard. And so the historic gavel fall of the young carpenter of Commons, Germany, is on trial for his life. New Jersey Attorney General David Willens is, at this very moment, making his opening statement, in which he's expected to demand the ultimate penalty for the murder of the Lindbergh baby. More news as it happens. This is A.L. Alexander in the courthouse at Flemington, New Jersey. And now from the beautiful ballroom atop the Union Hotel in historic Flemington, this is Martin Block with your make-believe ball. And there, in Hauptman's house, that man's house, that man right there, Bruno Richard Hauptman, in his house, hidden on the inside closet wall in his own handwriting, was the address and telephone number of Dr. John F. Condon. In his closet, on the inside, a little closet. I mean, you would have to get in on the inside, and he... Well, you have to be the same type of man as Hauptman is to get in there. Now this, in his own handwriting, and he's asked, why did you write Condon's telephone number on there? And he says, well, you know, I had a funny habit. I like to write telephone numbers or addresses. He quit his job the day he collected the $50,000. 
the very day because he wanted to live a life of luxury and ease, to go to Florida, have a boat on Hunter's Island and other places, and to have a new radio in the midst of the worst depression of this land, in May 1932, he spends $400 for a radio. 400 of Colonel Lindbergh's hard to get dollars, because in this depression, ladies and gentlemen, $50,000 is hard to get for anybody. To get honestly, that is, without killing. And one rail of that ladder comes right from his attic put there by his own tools, and we will prove it to you so that there will be no doubt about it. Now, men and women of the jury, if we do not prove these facts to you, why, you acquit him. Acquit him. But if we do, as we are confident that we will be able to do, then let me just tell you, representing the state of New Jersey, this state will not compromise with murder or murderers. We demand the penalty for first-degree murder. Your Honor pleases. I now move for a mistrial on the impassioned appeal of the Attorney General as not being a proper opening, but merely a summation and a desire to inflame the minds of the jury against this defendant before the start of the trial. The motion is denied. Terry, how many times have I told you not to run up those stairs? We interrupt our music to bring you this important news bulletin from the Hauptmann trial. Attorney General David Willens has called his first witness, the mother of the murdered baby, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. I went up to the nursery about 6 o'clock when he had almost finished his supper. Miss Gow gave him his supper in the nursery? Yes. And I stayed with them afterwards, helping to dress him and put him to bed. Now, Mrs. Lindbergh, I want to show you a picture and ask if that is a picture of the child. It is. Was he a healthy child? Healthy and playful. Normal? Perfectly normal. Oh, what color was his hair, please? His hair was light golden, and his eyes were blue. Now, Mrs. Lindbergh, how long did you stay in the nursery that night of March 1st, 1932? I stayed in the nursery until the baby was in his bed. About what time was that, please? About 7.30. Now, I'd like to show you what purports to be a sleeping suit. Number two, Dr. Denton. And ask if you can tell me what sleeping suit this is. I do. What sleeping suit is it, Mrs. Lindbergh? It is the sleeping suit that was placed on my child the night of March 1st. Now, I take it that the last time... Uh, no, I withdraw that. Now, on the night of March 1st, 1932, after you saw your child dressed for sleeping and as you were leaving the nursery at about 7.30 o'clock, did you happen to notice whether the window, uh, that is the east window, I think it's referred to, was closed? All the windows were closed when I left the room. But with particular reference to the east window, was it possible to lock it in addition to closing it? It was not, it was not possible to lock it. Now, what was the child doing when you left? He was asleep. And you have not seen that child since the first day of March, 1932, have you? No. Thank you, Mrs. Limber. Your witness, Mr. Riley. Your Honor, the... Defense feels that the grief of Mrs. Lindbergh needs no cross-examination. You may step down. 
And when asked to identify her child's sleeping garment, Mrs. Lindbergh broke down and wept. Attorney General Willens cut short his questions, and Defense Attorney Riley, visibly moved, refused to cross-examine. Mrs. Lindbergh was helped from the stand, and Colonel Charles Lindbergh, America's lonely... Now, whose voice was it, Colonel, that you heard in the vicinity of St. Raymond Cemetery that night saying, hey, doctor? That was Hauptmann's voice. You heard it again a second time. Where? At District Attorney Foley's office in New York in the Bronx. Now, coming back to that evening in the cemetery for a moment, after you paid the money and you read the note, you went out the following day and looked for your son as the note instructed, but to no avail. Is that correct? That is correct. And you continued following every lead, no matter how insubstantial it seemed, until finally on May 12th, 1932, were you called back to Hopewell? I was. Why were you called back, sir? To identify my son's body in the morgue. And did you positively identify the body as that of your son? I did. One last question, Colonel. Now, I believe that this experience with your firstborn and the constant harassment by the press and publicity seekers and cranks has forced you and your... If, if Your Honor, please, excuse me. With due deference to Colonel Lindbergh and Mrs. Lindbergh, we respectfully object to the distinguished attorney general making a statement at this time. Sir, I am attempting to Sir, show... you are attempting to plant antipathies in the minds of the jury beyond the scope of the alleged crime and directing those antipathies towards the defendant. Your Honor, I am attempting to show how much this mother and father are willing to sacrifice to protect their children once they became aware of the danger. My distinguished colleague will surely agree it is not fair to them to leave any trace of an inference that this tragedy was the result of parental carelessness. The Colonel may answer the question. We moved from Hopewell because we wanted our son John to be born in more protected circumstances. We now live at Inglewood. The grounds are patrolled by armed guards and guard dogs night and day. Would you say that that is a pleasant way to live, Colonel? No, it isn't. Thank you. Your witness, sir. Colonel Lindbergh, are you armed? Objection immaterial. May I suggest, Your Honor, that if Colonel Lindbergh is armed in this courtroom, it is very material. My objection is continued, Your Honor. The question is improper. I have no objection to answering the question. I'm not armed. Colonel, isn't it true that the real reason that you left Hopewell is because you had antagonized many of your neighbors and they let this be known? That is not true. Well, wasn't there any resentment among some local people when they felt ignored after you'd gone to a foreign agency to help you in hiring Betty Gao, a foreign nursemaid? I don't believe Miss Gao came from an agency. She was recommended to us by one of the people at the Morrow home in Inglewood who had known her. Let me tell you what I'm getting at, Colonel. What investigation did you make of Waitley before you took him into your house as a butler? What investigation did you make of Mrs. Waitley? What investigation did you make of Betty Gao before you placed your baby in her arms? I talked to them. You talked to them? Yes, I talked to them for a half an hour, perhaps an hour. I see. And beyond that, was there anything further? Beyond that, I never go any further. And then you didn't know that Betty Gao had two brothers? No. And had you learned that she had a brother who was in trouble in uh, New Jersey? I'm not sure that she has a brother at all. Now, when you decided to stay in Hopewell after the weekend and not go back to Englewood, very few people would know about this. Is that correct? Very few people know what I do. Yes, but... Betty Gow would have to know, wouldn't she? She was with the child. Of course, she would have to know. Thank you, Colonel. <laughs>
and I tell you, this was a place to... Oh, there's a friend of mine I want you to meet. Come on over. Excuse me, coming through, please. Coming through. Mr. Benny, how are you? I want you to meet my wife, Lily. Lily, this is one of America's greatest. Ooh, how nice. <laughs> yes. How many brothers do you have, Miss Gow? I have two brothers. And what are their names? Alexander and James. Where is Alexander now? In Glasgow, Scotland. And James? In Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, when did they return to Scotland? They have never been out of Scotland. This gal, do you know what perjury is? I know you committed it yesterday when you said one of my brothers had been in trouble in New Jersey. I intend to produce proof for the court. Your proof is false. It's easy enough to determine if I'm telling the truth, Your Honor. Colonel Schwarzkopf has investigated my story. Is Colonel Schwarzkopf in the courtroom? Give me a deposition. Uh, he's not, Your Honor, but I have a deposition from him in this matter. If Mr. Riley has no objection. Your Honor, I... No, I don't... You may proceed. New Jersey State Police has been in touch with Scotland Yard, Your Honor. Miss Gow's brothers have never been out of Scotland. Why didn't you tell me that this information had not been verified? I did. And the man in there looked out of the window at me like this. Uh, out of the window of the car, you mean? Yes, and he glares at me as if he saw a ghost. About what time of day was that, sir? It was in the forenoon. And this man that you saw looking at you out of the automobile, glaring at you in the manner that you say, is he in the courtroom? Yes. Would you mind stepping down, please, and showing us where he is? Please put your hand on his shoulder. Right here. You're crazy. May we have the record indicating Bruno Richard Hauptman. Now, sir, you were telling us a minute ago about the car coming around the corner, and when it made the turn into the lane, did it proceed or did it stop? It stopped as it got in the ditch. And the man in there pulled the ladder over to him. Now, what did you say about a ladder? He had a ladder in there with him. <laughs> you say you're how old? I'm in my 87th year. Can you see me from there? Yes. Want me to come closer? No. Are you nearsighted or farsighted? My eyes are all right. I didn't ask you that, mister. You are wearing glasses. Now, why are you wearing glasses? It's to see better, isn't it? At a distance, yes. For reading, I read without my glasses. You ever been in an institution? What do you mean? A hospital? Once. Where? Poughkeepsie. In the Hudson River State Hospital. In 1874, I was employed as a kitchen boy. <laughs> you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Thank you. Will you state your name, your age, and your address, please, sir? My name is John Francis Condon. I'm 74 years old, and I live at 974. Decatur Avenue and the most beautiful borough in the world, the Bronx. <laughs> and I believe, sir, that you're an educator? Oh, perhaps I should start with my academic credentials and then proceed to my professional experience. In this. As you wish. After Colonel Lindbergh read the note, what did you do? Colonel Lindbergh and I uh, went back to his automobile. Uh, well, it wasn't his automobile exactly, I understand it was borrowed. That was about 8 o'clock. Now, did you have with you uh, that night at the cemetery, uh, you and Colonel Lindbergh, a box of money? 
Colonel Lindbergh uh, had a box with the $50,000 and an envelope with the extra 20000 The envelope wouldn't fit into the box very did well. Did you give some money in a box that night, sir? I did. Who did you give the money to? To John. Who is John? John is... Bruno Richard Hauptmann. And then you, as a loyal American, decide that you and only you. Oh. <laughs> I never said that. You are coming to the aid of America's hero to serve as a go-between. And then you decide that the best way to contact the criminals is to put an ad in the little Bronx News. You mean the Bronx Home News, a circulation of 150,000 and over. It's a pretty good paper. The point is that you chose the Bronx News over the big metropolitan dailies. The Bronx Home News. And within 24 hours after your offer is published in this little paper, you received a letter, did you not, from the kidnap gang with their secret sign in it. Yeah. Let's talk about identification now. Have you seen any newspaper men lately? Oh, plenty. Did you tell any of them that Halpin was not John? No, sir. You never told any newsman that this defendant was John, did you? No, I never did. I, oh, I make a distinction between identification and declaration of identification. In a New York police station, you said it was not the man. No, 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 no. Bring them all here. I never said it was. I never said it was not. There is a man's life because at stake. Because you are not sure. Because. Because I make a distinction between identification and declaration. By identification, I meant that I knew mentally. And by declaration, I meant what I said to others. But you did not, did not identify him. No, I, there is that word identification again. I take exception to your language. You would make me seem dishonest, and I am not, and I will not have is that too stern, Judge? Uh, no, no, no. Hey, Jeffsy! Hey, oh, Jeffsy! We're behind you, Jeffsy! Did you identify him? It's him, isn't it? We're proud of you! Yay for Jeffsy! Lindy, did you testify? What did you tell him? Good to see you. Sweetheart, I want you to meet one of America's leading journalists, Mr. Bonnie Fane. This is my wife, Francie. Hello. Nice How to meet you, you, Mrs. Riley. Bruno is dumb. 50G is peanuts. Wait till us pros get John. And there's a drawing at the bottom, another skull's head. Yes, I'll save it, Major. And would you tell Colonel Schwarzkopf I'd like him to put several more men around the Inglewood place, if you don't mind? Yes. But under no circumstances is Mrs. Lindbergh to be told. And notice it is spelled S-I-N-G-N-A-T-U-R-E each time. Surely more than a coincidence. Similarly, when the word ignore appears in the note, there's an unnecessary N before the G, just as in the spelling of the signature. Now, there's also the use of Germanic spellings and words. B-O-A-D, boat for boats. And G-U-T, gut for good. Or the child is in gut care, for instance, that sort of thing. Uh, now, perhaps I should go to another uh, charge. Summing up uh, briefly, sir. Now, uh, your comparison of the ransom notes, uh, do they prove that they were all written by the same man? 
Yes, they do. And comparing the ransom notes with the admitted writings of Bruno Richard Hauptman and with the writings made at the request of the New York police, who would you say had written all the notes? Hauptman wrote them. Thank you, sir. You may resume your seat. Your witness, Mr. Riley. Mr. Osborne, I am not going to humiliate you by asking you how many courts of law have repudiated your opinion. I wish you I'm would, going sir. I'm to proceed quickly to the flaws. Because I cannot reason. recall a single time. For instance, I... for instance, the numbers that were written by the kidnapper on the ransom notes, there is no similarity, if any, to the numbers written by Mr. Hauptman on his automobile license registration. Is that not true? Yes, that is true. Now, these... However, now, these figures, these numbers, have not been included in the charts that were made for the court. No, they were not. The fact is... The fact the numbers... is... The fact is that these charts were not included because they would not help Mr. Wilentz convict an innocent man. Now, Mr. Osborne, if you were a German immigrant and you were uneducated in this country, do you suppose you would use some German words when you wrote a letter? It's possible. And do you suppose that... Other German immigrants out there would do the same thing. Write aus, A-U-S for out, O-U-T. Are you willing to send a man to the electric chair because he does not write perfect English? So anyway, now the jury knows I didn't write those notes. Hey, Dave, you know, just being a German doesn't mean that you're guilty in this country. Is that true? That's for sure. <sighs> Did you kill any deer this year, Dave? This year? No. Last year, I went hunting near uh, Bernardsville, and I killed a big one. And he had a big, uh, what you call it, uh, on his head. A rack. Yeah. And the year before that, I went hunting in Pennsylvania, and I killed one then. So each time I kill a deer. And next year, also, I kill one. Maybe. You're gonna burn, burn the burn the burn the yeah. Maybe. I saw those. Willens, weekends in Washington. For talks with FDR, of course. I said I saw them. Yeah. Willens holds conference. Willens. 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 I don't see anything about your press conference regarding tax reforms and the reduction of municipal debts. Page two. Yeah. Willen's going to fry this character, you better believe me. Lindbergh sits there every day like some kind of a saint overseeing the operation. Well, the jury's not going to disappoint him in a million years. Willen's is their instrument for revenge. Willen's is the new boy wonder. You're the ex-boy wonder. Hey, Fred. Suppose this bum is really guilty. This is no time for jokes, Hal. What are you going to do? Well, for the time being, I'm going to do like the Diamond Dance gals. Keep smiling. Act like I love it. Come on. Come. How you doing? How you doing, huh? Hello. How are you, John? Yeah. Where's Thor, John? Where's Thor? Hmm? Yeah. Another one. Well, I think the time is coming very soon when we have to decide whether we can continue to live in this country, that's all. Horsey? John? John. Horsey? <laughs> you want to play horsey, John? Horsey? Here we go. Here we go. Horsey! Horsey! Horsey. 
Kaylor. Now, Mr. Kaler, after following 42 loads of uh, one by four with these peculiar milling marks all over the country, you finally found a similar piece in the lumber yard in the Bronx. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is correct. I uh, finally found a piece of wood which uh, I believe to have come from the same milling as side rail 16 from a ladder. Uh, that's when the suspect was arrested. I was most anxious to search the premises, which I did. And where eventually I found a Joyce in the defendant attic. Uh, that Joyce is uh, on, in evidence here. Now, sir, would you mind summing up the evidence of these photographs? Yes, sir. I'll, uh... Well, this, this picture is an enlargement of the nail holes, square nail holes, uh, made by cut nails, which are very rare, in both the choice and the side rail. Now, these, these nail holes are exactly the same in both pieces of wood. They're the same distance apart, the same direction from each other, and precisely on the same slant. And in addition, the hand plane marks on this side rail were made by Hopman's plane. You may resume your seat now, sir. <clears throat> now, sir, I want to show you two boards, which are the same boards shown in that photograph. Mr. Kaler, in your opinion, as an expert on wood, is there a relationship between the state's exhibit S226, the attic board, and the side rail of the ladder, which is the state's exhibit S211? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, those two pieces of wood at one time were one piece. They've been cut in two. Thank you, sir. Your witness, Mr. Riley. Mr. Keller. Just for my own benefit, and the jury's benefit, too, of course. I would just like to get something straight. Now, in spite of this, this mumbo-jumbo, in spite of... Objection! I withdraw the word. In spite of this testimony, when you say that these two boards were once one and the same board, you are expressing your opinion. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that, that is correct. Thank you. Are you still of the opinion, as an expert, Mr. Kaler, that the defendant's board from his addict and the side rail number 16 were at one time one and the same piece of wood? Yes, sir. I am. Thank you, sir. You may step down now. Your Honor, the state rests. Wer ist der gute Deutsch in dieser Geschichte? Hauptmann! Yeah! Und wer ist der Jude? Attorney General Wilanski! Yeah! Wir werden Wilanski nicht über Hauptmann triumphieren lassen! Yeah! Ich bitte meine großzügige Spende für Frau Hauptmann, ihren Sohn und ihren lieben Mann. Bruno Richard Hauptman. Take the stand, please. Place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Your Honor, please. Uh, Mr. Riley and I have agreed, and we want the jury to know that we have agreed, that a sheriff's guard will be behind the witness. All right, proceed. Would you state your full and correct name, please? Bruno Richard Hartmann. Where and when were you born? 26th of November, 1899, Saxony, Germany. And did you go to school? Yeah, eight years public school, uh, two years, two to three years um, 
It was like a, a, a trade school. I see. And you apprenticed at what age? 14. I was a carpenter's helper. Did you serve in the German army? Uh, when I was 17, they took me for the war. Did you serve in combat? Yeah. Did you suffer any wounds? No, I was gassed. Um, Christmas 1918, they sent me home. I see. And were you able to find any work at that time? No. Germany was in poor condition then, wasn't it? It was. And so at the at that particular period of reconstruction in Germany, about 1919, 1920, you were convicted of a minor offense. Is that correct? I was. Mm. When was that? That was springtime 1919. And as a result, did you serve any sentence? Yes. And afterwards, you were paroled? Yes. And finally, after your third attempt to come to America as a stowaway, you were successful. Yes. Yes. Why were you so determined to come to America? Well, uh, because uh, in America, everything. Uh, well, uh, no, it is a great country. I always dreamed to come here. And you found work here? Yes, right away I worked. It's a um, mechanic, tire. Carpenter. Now, when did you meet Anna, Anna Schoffler? That was 1924. And when did you marry Anna Schoffler? That was 10th October 1925. And did Anna work after your marriage? Yes. And how much did she make? Oh, she makes uh, 20, 25 dollars, I guess, and about uh, uh, five to eight dollar tips. Did you save your money? Yeah, we spent it very little. We opened right from the beginning a bank account. It was United States Bank. Look, it's for my defense fund. They send me $10. 10 huh? Eh? Yeah. That's pretty good, Bruno. Do you know? The German people in this country, the German communities in America. Yeah, they know, they believe I am innocent because every day they send me checks, money. Even if they're poor, they send me one dollar because they know I'm innocent. Now, come on now, Bruno. Half of these people just want your autograph and a check. It'll be worth plenty one of these days. Especially if I'm dead. In other words, Isidore Fish became a good friend. You trusted him. You even invested some of your hard-earned money in his fur business. Yeah, he... I was partners with him. Now, when was the last time Mr. Fish came to your house before he sailed for Europe? The night before he sailed. And when he sailed, did he give you something for you to take care of while he was in Europe? Yes, he left two suitcases. What else? Uh, 400 seal skins, the Hudson seal skins. What else? And a little box. What kind of box? A shoe box. And what was in the box? Well, I didn't ask what was in it. Uh, he only said that there's paper in it. But I thought maybe they were... Just a minute. They were bells. Just a minute. Now, Your Honor, I object to what he thought. Just tell us what you did, please, and not what you thought. Um, I put it in the broom closet. And where is the broom closet in your apartment? Broom closet is in uh, the kitchen. But what part of the broom closet did you put it? Please? What part of the broom closet did you put it in? Ah, uh, on the upper shelf. Now, how long did that shoebox remain there before you disturbed it? Middle of August. Uh, 34. 34? Yes. And what caused you to disturb it? Well, um, <clears throat> I was looking for uh, a broom. The broom is on the left side of the closet. So when I took the broom, I must damage the box with the broom handle. Uh, so I looked up, and that way I saw that it was money. I damaged the box. And you saw the money? Yes, sir. Now, did you take the box down? Yeah, I took it down to the garage. And what money did you see in the box? Gold certificates. It's the same money they found in your garage? It was. And was Mr. Fish dead at that time? 
He was, yes. In other words, to save the court the time and the trouble of going over each of these letters individually, let me ask you this. Did you mail any ransom note at any time to anybody? I did not. Did you see Dr. Condon before your arrest? I did not. Now, you've seen this ladder here in court, I take it. Yes. Did you build this ladder? I am a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> Did you build this ladder? Certainly not. Would you come down here, please, and look at it? Yes, it, uh, it looks like a music instrument. <laughs> When were you beaten by the police? I object, Your Honor. Mr. Riley is telling him that he was beaten. I uh, suppose, um, and let me phrase it this way. At what time were you beaten, if you were beaten? Your Honor, I still object. It's just a pet. Yes. Well, uh, let him tell. Were you beaten, yes or no? Yes, sir. When did it start? Uh, the second night I got arrested. And where were you? There's a New York police station. And in this New York police station, did they ask you to write something for them? Yes, they told me I should uh, uh, write some words. And in writing, did you spell the words of your own free will, or did they tell you how to spell the words? Well, uh, some of them, the words, uh, they spell it to me. How do you spell signature? S-I-G-N-U-T-U-R-E. And did they tell you to spell it S-I-N-G? They did. N-A-T-U-R-E? They did. See, so when they dictated the spelling, you were not spelling of your own free will, were you? I was not. No more questions. Mr. Defendant, you've had an opportunity in this courtroom today, and you still have an opportunity right this minute to tell the whole truth. Have you told the whole truth? I told already the truth. So that you stand now on the story that you've given today. I do. Now, Mr. Riley asked about the time you were convicted in Germany, and you said yes, and that you were paroled. Yes. So you mean you were only convicted of one crime, is that it? Yes, sir. Only convicted once? Convicted once. Only once? Only once. On March 15, 1919, breaking and entering in through a second-story window in the city of Reichowitz. Now, wasn't that another charge you were convicted of? That... Uh, it was a charge. I ask you again, sir, is it a fact that you were convicted of breaking and entering into the mayor's home on March 15, 1919? Uh, well, uh, it's about right. Uh, I can't remember. Breaking in through a second story window. You went in through a second-story window, didn't you? Yes. Isn't it also a fact, sir, that you were convicted, you and another man were convicted of holding up two women with a gun? It is. It 
Two women wheeling baby carriages? Everybody wheels baby carriages. Everybody wheels baby carriages. And you and this other man with a gun held up these two women wheeling baby carriages, and you went into that baby carriage and took that purse. Isn't that right? We object to the question. He's answered the question, sir. No, no, no. I couldn't comment on a trial in progress. I only visited the courtroom for a very few minutes. I will say this. Uh, I came here today because uh, Flemington is one of my favorite New Jersey towns, and I wanted to say hello to a few of my friends out there. Well, Governor, it was very kind of you to uh, drop into our studio. Well, I just felt the urge, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, I could hardly wait. You know how it is. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me, I have a little uh, <clears throat> business to take care of. Uh, of course, Governor, and thank you again, sir. And now back to Martin Block in the make-believe ballroom. So the only person that knows about any monies between you and Fish is uh, Fish, isn't that right? As far as I know. Yes, and he's dead. It's unfortunate. Yes, for him at least. Did he help you kidnap the Lindbergh baby and murder it? I never saw Mr. Lindbergh's child. But Fish didn't help you, did he? Object to your honor. He has a right to finish his answer. Yes, I suppose he has. I thought that he had finished. You knew he hadn't. Mr. Fisher. You need not shout in that fashion. Just make your objections in a quiet, orderly fashion, and we shall deal with them in a quiet, orderly fashion. Proceed. Let's get back to the accounts again. Actually, you lost money, didn't you? You lost money every year in your brokerage accounts right up until April 2, 1932. Isn't that right? Yes. Did you hear the testimony before the court about Dr. Condon paying $50,000 to a fellow named John one night? Yes. You remember what night that happened? No. April 2, 1932, the same day that you started showing profits in the market. Quite a coincidence, wouldn't you say? Now, you and your wife were partners, weren't you? Both working very hard. Yes. But when you found the $14,000 in gold, no more partnership with a wife. Absolutely not. Why should I make my wife excited about it? Oh, I see. You were clearly cheating her with the books of the accounts. Why not keep the $14,000 from her, too? Isn't that right? Should it be a pleasant surprise for her sometime? I see. You were keeping a surprise for her. Yes, because my attention was to pay her house, to build her house sometime. Why are you smiling? You think that's such a brilliant answer? No, it is the truth. You're having a lot of fun with me, aren't you? No, sir. Well, you're doing very well. You're smiling at me every five minutes. No, sir. You think you're a big shot, don't you? Well, should I cry? Oh, certainly you shouldn't. But you do think you're bigger than everybody, don't you? No, but I know I'm innocent. Yeah, you're the man that has the willpower. That is what you know, isn't it? No, sir. You wouldn't tell if they murdered you, would you? No. Willpower is everything to you, isn't it? No, I, I feel innocent, and I am innocent, and that keeps me the power to stand up. Lying? When you swear to God you will tell the truth? Telling lies tell me nothing to you, do they? Stop that. Didn't you swear to untruths in the Bronx courthouse? Stop that. Didn't you swear to untruths in the courthouse? Didn't you lie? Under oath, time and time again, didn't you? I did not. You did not? No. All right, sir. Now, when you were arrested with this Lindbergh ransom money, and you had a $20 bill, Lindbergh ransom money, did they ask you where you got it? Did they ask you? They did. And did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? I... <clears throat> I said not the truth. You lied, didn't you? I did, yes. Yes. Lies, lies, lies. You see, you're not smiling anymore, are you? Smiling? It's gotten a little more serious, hasn't it? Well, I guess it isn't any place to smile, yeah. I am a carpenter. I am. That was funny, wasn't it? No, sir, there was nothing funny about it. Well, you got a big laugh, didn't you? Did someone tell you to give that answer? When Mr. Riley asked you about the ladder to stand in front of the jury and say, I am a carpenter. No, sir. You've got a peculiar notion about willpower, haven't you? Well, I think this has gone just about far enough. I do too, sir. Patent abuse of the witness. Patent abuse of the truth. Your Honor, may I have that remark stricken from the record? Your Honor, I think the record will show that the defendant has been lying, and I think that I have a right to say so. The remark will not be stricken. However, the court is prepared 
to hold either or both of you in contempt if you raise your voices at each other once again in this court. Now proceed. Now, I believe you testified that when the police made you do the request writings, they told you how to spell the words. Is that right? Yes. They told you to spell boat, B-O-A-D? Yes, sir. And signature, S-I-N-G-N-A-T-U-R-E? Well, however I wrote it was how they told me to. So they told you to spell the word S-I-N-G-N-A-T-U-R-E. They told you to put an N before the G so it would read sing instead of sig? Yes. You're sure of that? I wanted to spell it right. They wouldn't let me. I would like the record to show that the word signature or signature does not appear in the request writings at all. The defendant never wrote such a word for the police. No further questions, Your Honor. He's got another one of his wives with him. New one every week. Colonel Lindbergh, Mr. Willen. Harry, where there's forced Colonel Lindbergh to try your food tonight. Good, good. Follow me. I have a special table for you. Good. Come. Everything fine? Fine. Good. Hey, Harry. Yes, sir. I'll take your coat, Colonel. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner, and I'll be back. Excellent. Well, I'm told the uh, sour browden is good. Fine, I'll have it then. Oh, why don't we start off with a good draft beer? All right. David, Colonel Lindbergh, sir. No. I, David, Colonel, if I could just have a few minutes with you, sir. There's Barney, a few questions Barney, there. the Colonel and I'd like a little privacy. Yeah, I understand that, but maybe you remember me, sir. I was in the, I was in the nursery on the night there. Through the window maybe. like a thief. But I was yes, just trying to find out how Barney. Mrs. Lindbergh was feeling. You really zinged him with that signature thing, David. That was good. That was good. Harry. Colonel, can, can I at least print that Mrs. Lindbergh is, is Barney, holding up? Barney, Barney, leave him alone. Is Come she on, adjusting to, to the table. ordeal? Come All right, on, fine, Barney, fine, fine. I'm going, I'm going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's go, Bruno. Time for the afternoon session. It's time for more of Mr. Riley's stupid witnesses. So your story is, Mr. Von Henke, that on the night of the kidnapping, you definitely saw Bruno Richard Hauptman walking a dog in the Bronx. That is what I saw, yes. Mr. Von Henke, who is August Von Storff? That is me. I thought you said your name was Von Henke. Yes. And who is August Marenke? That was me during the war. Oh, so you are August Marenke and August von Storff and August von Henke. Which one of you claims to have seen the defendant walking this dog? <laughs> what is Mr. Riley trying to do to me? Is he trying to burn me? So I'll tell you something, I wouldn't believe any of those witnesses he brought into court. I wouldn't believe any of them. I wouldn't believe them if they told me the sunrise is in the east. Bruno, Bruno, we've had some good witnesses for you. Anna made a very good impression. Mr. Riley's summation was... Well, it's no good. Bruno, we're doing the best we can. I'll tell you something. Willens is killing me. Either this man is the filthiest and vilest snake that has ever crept through the grass, or he's entitled to an acquittal. And if you believe, as we do, then you have to convict him. If you bring in a recommendation of mercy, a wishy-washy verdict, yes, that's your province to do so. But if you believe as we do, then it seems to me that you have and will have the courage to find him guilty, guilty of murder in the first degree. Thank you. The court will adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning.
can go up. Judge Trenchard is making his charge. I'm sorry. The crime of murder is not always committed in the presence of witnesses. And when not so committed, it has to be established by circumstantial evidence or not at all. If you desire to return a verdict of murder in the first degree, coupled with imprisonment for life, then you must so put it in your verdict. Because the law reads that every person convicted of murder in the first degree shall suffer death unless the jury shall, by their verdict and as a part thereof, recommend imprisonment at hard labor for life, in which case this and no greater punishment may be imposed. Now, the clerk will swear in these constables to safely keep the jury till they have agreed on their verdict. Hey, Bruno. Bruno, you've got visitors. Hello. This is Houtman. Let him take your card, eh? Come on, baby. Look in here. Oh. Come on. Come on. Hello. Hey. You know who this is? Yeah. Come on. Of course I'm. It's a big fellow. Huh? Hey, Manfred, the big boy. He hasn't seen him already in a while. Ah. Yes, he knows his father all right, eh? Hey, what are you crying for? Don't you like the clown? Look at the clown. Look at the clown. What time is it? 10.30. Means they've been out uh, about 11 hours now. Isn't that good? Well, anyway, some of them know I'm innocent, so that's good. Maybe. Jury's coming in. Will the defendant rise and face the jury? Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. Mr. Foreman, how say you? Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? We, the jury, find the defendant, Bruno Richard Halpin, guilty of murder in the first degree. No! Richard Hauptman, you have been convicted of murder in the first degree. The sentence of this court is that you shall suffer death at a time and place 
and in the manner provided by law. Yes, this is he. Thank you. Death. Barbarians. Hey, extra. Help me get the last minute reprieve. Read all about it. Hey, kid, let me see one of those. Hey, read all about it here. Can I tell you if that damn Republican Hoffman won the state would go to hell? Oh, you've got to understand the reprieve was a mistake. It backfired on us. I mean, the conviction was popular. The people loved it. All right, so it made Willens a big man, so we'll learn to live with it. I got worse news for you, Fred. I don't need any worse news. When you reprieved that bum, the people wanted to lynch you. I got to make a statement now. The Supreme Court is going to make a ruling any day now. If you make another statement, it'll be political suicide. And if I don't make a statement before the Supreme Court ruling, it'll be superfluous. Hell, what the hell's the matter with you? Look, I know you used this tact to embarrass Willens. We all knew that. But now it's turning around the other way, and it's embarrassing us. Now, why don't we just take our losses and get out? I told you I had worse news for you, Fred. I'm not backing off. I've gone too far. I want some altruism on my record. You what? I met with Dave Willens. I'm convinced he's not politically motivated. But my dear friend... He told me himself that he's against capital punishment. The only reason he asked for the death penalty was because it's a state law. Now, I believe Hauptman was involved in this thing but not alone. And I don't want to see him die until this thing is solved. Hal, have you lost your marbles? This thing is political. <laughs> well, maybe I've gone soft in the head, but um, I'm issuing a call today for a new trial. You won't get it. You won't get a second term, either. Well, there's bad news tonight. Lucky Lindy has left us. The news was released only after his ship was well at sea. Charles A. Lindbergh, America's own lone eagle, has taken his wife and little son and fled our shores for England. It's a tragedy of American life that we must torture our heroes, it seems. We drove him out, drove him out of the nest, made his life a hell. Of course I was shocked. This is a great American tragedy. When are the representatives of this country going to stand up and defy gangsterdom? 
and individual marauders. When are they going to stop trading national heroes like Colonel Lindbergh for the discarded miscreants of other countries who kidnap and murder? And I blame Governor Hoffman of New Jersey for this more than any other one man. It was he who kept the wound open long, long after it should have been closed. You got company, Bruno. I'm afraid I got bad news. There are no more appeals left to us. Governor Hoffman's run out of the legal powers of reprieve. Supreme Court's refused. Court of pardons. Bruno. Bruno, you got to listen to me. You must trust me. Haven't I stuck by you through everything? But there's nothing else that I can do, that anybody can do, unless... Listen, no one wants you to die. Lindbergh wants me to die. Lindbergh is out of this. Hoffman wants to save your life. But his hands are tied, unless... Unless you tell the whole truth. Clear up some of these things. Only you can clear up. And the worst you'll get is a commutation to life. You won't die. Just think what that would mean to Anna and little Manfred. But you've got to help us to help you. You have got to tell the whole truth. I told already the truth. Governor, in the name of human decency, you've got to make one more effort. I'm asking you to call the president. I'd look like a fool. We're talking about a man's life. He's already suffered cruel and inhuman punishment. Three times he's gotten himself ready to die, and three times he's been reprieved. The last time they even shaved his head. For God's sakes, the man's died three times already in his soul. What good is it to kill him again? Alive, in prison, he could be a source of study. Alive, well, he might even talk someday. But dead, he's just another victim of mass revenge. The law is the law. The law's not the law. The law is what men make it. If you let them bury Hauptmann, you're letting them bury the answers to a thousand questions about this case forever. <clears throat> I, uh... I can't stop them. They said 8 o'clock. Maybe the governor's doing his act again. Ah, uh, that crook. If I had my way, he'd find poo. Son of the living God, who suffered thee, in the name of the Holy Ghost, who hath been shed upon thee, the company of saints and angels, may thy portion this day be in peace in thy dwelling place in Zion. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.
He's dead. Telephone, sir. Hello. Yes. Thank you. It's over. Will it ever really be over? <laughs> 